Good evening, friends. This is your host to welcome you through the creaking door into the inner sanctum for another quiet, restful evening on the homey side. <laughs> uh, what's that, madam? Oh, the humidity. You feel that? Well, right this way, into the morgue, this cold slab will straighten you out. <laughs> oh, too cold. Well, how about a nice hot poker game? Cutthroat. <laughs> well, how about a nice sociable game of bridge? No? Oh, I see. Yeah, it's afraid of the stiff competition. Uh-huh. Oh, you play. Well, remember, you gotta pay up if you lose. We got enough deadheads here. <laughs> Tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery, Deadly Fair, was written by Henry Warner and stars Larry Haynes in the role of Angelo with Everett Sloan as Philip. Just a moment. Don't settle back in your chair. You're going for a ride. Ready? It's the dark hour before dawn. Along the tree-lined suburban highway, the headlights of the speeding sedan poke two long yellow fingers through the swirling dew. Behind the wheel of the sedan, a local taxi, sits Angelo Minetti, the cab driver, the cold nose of a madman's gun pressed against the back of his neck, wondering by what fate a man like himself will live through the beachheads at Salerno and Anzio, only to come home to die like this. Wondering how long before the madman's trigger finger bends in a nervous twitch and makes a widow out of his wife, Josie, and a fatherless boy of a seven-year-old son, Johnny. I'm sorry I yelled at you tonight, Johnny. Sorry I made you cry, but... if I ever get out of this, you can have all the crayons you want. A hundred boxes of crayons, and you can mark up all the walls, you can mark up the whole house. Pray for me, Johnny. I can't die like this. What a break. Just because I was a good guy and changed shifts with Connolly. I guess it was just the cards for me instead of Connolly. Just the cards to be working nights and meet the 225 when it pulled into large parts. Taxi? Here you are, ma'am. You going to the manor? Yes, ma'am. I took a quick look up and down the station platform to watch for stragglers. Bad business leaving a local citizen stranded in the middle of the night. Then I saw him coming towards me carrying a suitcase. He must have got off from the first car. Is this a taxi? Yes, sir. Oh, I can't tell these suburban taxis look like private cars. Where to, sir? You go to New Rochelle? I slept past my station. Well, good thing you only slept by one station. Sure, I'll take it. Uh, if you don't mind riding while I drop this lady. Thanks. I took the mic off the dashboard. Call the office. 64, call in radio taxi. 64, call in radio taxi. Come in, 64. Station of Manor, then Rochelle. Check. I put the mic back on the dashboard hook and settled down for the run. How are you boys doing since you installed the two-way radio service? Oh, fine, fine. Must say, it's improved the service. Was it dependable? Oh, yes, ma'am. No trouble at all. Circuit's always open for us to receive messages. I want to talk back. I just pressed the button on the hand mic. 30 something. Uh, what's the address? 76 Manor Lane. Calling 64. Radio taxi calling 64. Hey, Angelo, listen to me. <laughs> what's eating you, Louie? Place on fire? Hey, Angelo, just got a police call. Don't pick up a guy with a tan raincoat. The cops are looking for him. He's a killer. Uh, take it easy, Louie. Now, what's this you're saying about a killer? What is The cops say he got on at Grand Central with a ticket to New Rochelle. But so what? But listen, Angelo. The guy didn't get off at New Rochelle. You pick up someone with a tan raincoat? I didn't dare turn around to look. To see if the man in the back seat had a raincoat. You could almost hear the woman sitting beside him holding her breath. And then I recall the guy as he walked down the station platform. 
I recall plain that he did not have a raincoat. Only a suitcase. Will you pipe down, Lou? You better get some coffee at the diner. If you fall asleep, you'll be having nightmares. Roger. Good thing I have no raincoat, madam. What? Uh, uh, yes. Strange that all that should stand in the way is a raincoat. Uh, how's that? Uh, driver, right there, please. It's on the next street light. How much is it? Uh, 35 cents. Thanks. Uh, you changed. She just waved her hand as if telling me to keep it. Change from a dollar. She, uh, seems kind of scared, if you ask me. Are you? Well, scared? What for? The killer. Ah, that Louie, he gets excited about everything. Always adding a little out of his own head. Uh, what's the address in New Bayside Lane, 36. Uh, 36 Bayside Lane? Yes, know the place? Uh, off Hillside Road, long driveway. That's it. I drove a party up there from the manor tonight. What did he look like? Well, I didn't say it was a hint, did I? Well, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. Tall chap, slick looking, mustache. Well, look, I, I didn't talk out of turn, did I, mister? Not at all. I rather expect I'll find him still there. What's your name? Angelo Minetti. Mine's Baker. But don't let me embarrass you, Angelo. It's quite all right. That party you drove to my house is seeing my wife. Isn't that what you think? Oh, you got me wrong, mister. I don't think nothing. Don't you really? Lots of others think so. Rather common gossip, as they say. But I'm not angry. Not at all. I'll take care of everything once I get home. Calling 64. Radio taxi calling 64. Hey, Minetti. Come in, Louie. Got some more dope on that killer. He got into Grand Central on the train from Albany. Porter in the club car told the cops a guy was making cracks about having a gun and uh, taking care of the wife and the boyfriend. Well, so what? What are you bothering me with it for? Go call the Daily News or the Mirror. Well, wait a minute. Now, here's what I want to tell you. The cops at Mamaroneck got on the train and found the raincoat hanging on a hook in the first car. Conductor thinks it was left by a guy who got off at Larchmont with a suitcase. How about that fare you picked up? There was a gun in my fare's hand. And the gun was at the side of my head. His finger was on his lips, warning me. You did say Rochelle, didn't you? I could see the trigger finger bending. And his head shaking from side to side to tell me to say no. Uh, no, no, Louis. I, I had two. Uh, one to the manor, the other to Rockdale. Not, not Rochelle. I didn't get it right the first time. I got to call you. Also, also, he didn't have a suitcase. Oh, that's a relief. Say, uh, how's about coming back to the shack so as I can get a bite at the diner? Yeah, sure thing. Soon as I'm free. This guy wants me to wait for him. Take him back to the station. Roger. Nice work, Angelo. I got a wife and kid to think of, mister. Do you want to go to 36 Bayside Lane? That's right. Better slow down. There's Bayside Lane right ahead. All right, this'll do. I wouldn't like it if they heard us coming up the driveway. There'll be a dollar and a quarter, sir. Get out, Angelo. You uh, want me to get out? That's right. You're coming in with me. To be my witness. Witness? What for? Divorce, maybe. Oh, no, please, Mr. Baker, that's not right. I can't afford to get mixed up like this. Roll my taxi. Get please. out. And don't slam the door. Yes, sir. Carry my bag, please. He steered me with the gun in my bag. Slowly picking each step in the dark across the lawn, shielded by a high hedge, and around to the back of the house, to the kitchen. The lights were on, and we could see his wife and the boyfriend making themselves some bacon and eggs. All right, Angelo. Pull open the door. What? Hello, Doris. Philip. Hello, Walter. What are you doing with that gun? Please, Philip. Excuse me while I close the door, Walter. No use waking the neighbors. Oh, Doris, this is Angelo. Walter, Angelo. The introductions were polite, all right, but deadly. And he looked like he was enjoying it, a big joke. But there was nothing funny about that crazy grin on his face and the way he kept waving the gun around at the three of us. Well, Walter? Philip, please, you frighten me. Walter's not frightened. 
He never was. Of me? Isn't that so, Walter? Well, why don't you answer? There's nothing to say. Doris, do you love Walter? Come now. Of course. And you, Walter, do you love Doris? Yes. You dirty liar. Oh, please. He's lying, Doris. I know he's lying. He wouldn't go around bragging how he sees you every time I go out of town if he really loved you. That's not true. We're going to be married. Oh, married. <laughs> not until you become a widow, Doris. I'll never give you a divorce. Or are you planning to divorce me? All right, Philip. You found me here and you have a witness. What are you going to do about it? I came back from Albany tonight to kill you. Philip! But I'll give you just one more chance. If I ever hear that you're trying to see Doris again behind my back, I swear I'll kill you. And Angelo here can be my witness that I warned you. Remember that, Angelo. Yes, you got me wrong, Philip. Sure, I've been seeing Doris, but I never went around talking about it. Don't come any closer, Walter. Why, I said to Doris, let's tell him. Give me that gun. Let go. Let go, my Give me that gun. Philip, Philip, please, please stop it. Stop it. Doris. The three of us stood there, paralyzed. Looking down on the still body of Mrs. Baker, her eyes glassy and blue, her blonde hair soaking up the blood from the hole in her head. One look was enough for the three of us to know that she was dead. You! You killed her, Philip! I. I killed her! No, Walter. You killed her! Didn't he, Angelo? stood there glaring at one another across the body of Mrs. Baker. Yes. You killed her, Walter. The gun was in my hand, but you killed her. If you hadn't tried to take the gun away from me, I... where are you going? Phone the police. The police? Yes. Put down that phone. Put it down. Don't you think you ought to put that gun away now? He's right, Mr. Baker. I don't think he even heard you. He kneeled down beside the body of his wife and stared at her tenderly. Suddenly his mouth started to move like he was choking for air and his face twisted in angry pain and hate as he looked up at Walter. I could see Walter sensing it too, realizing that Mr. Baker was going out of his mind. There was a heavy glass ashtray by the phone. I could see Walter slowly reaching for it. Mr. Baker looked up and jumped back as Walter threw it. You won't stop him! You stay out of this, Angelo! Don't shoot! Don't! Doctor! Angelo! Doctor! You're going to die, Walter! Die like Doris! Angelo! Help me! Doctor! Don't bother, Angelo. He won't need a doctor. Stop it! No, no, don't do it, Mr. Baker. Give him a chance. Please, give him a chance. <laughs> He doesn't need a doctor now, Angelo, does he? Go on. Bend over him. See if he needs a doctor. He's dead. Yes. Now they're both dead. Both dead. What do we do, Mr. Baker? Do? What? What is there to do? The police. We ought to call the police. They'll take me away from Doris. I don't want to leave her. No, I mustn't leave Doris. No, please. Please, Mr. Baker, won't you give me the gun? The gun? No. No, I got the gun to protect myself from Walter. But, but I'm not afraid of Walter anymore. He's dead. Walter's dead. That's right. Doris is dead and Walter's dead. We can't leave them here. We must take them away to a nice, quiet place where they can be alone forever. We, we take them away in your car, Angelo. My, my car? Yes, Angelo. You must do as I tell you. It will be their funeral car. The kitchen was next to the garage. And he made me drive my car into the garage. Open the trunk compartment, Angelo. He kept the gun on me and followed me into the kitchen. He pointed to her first. I picked her up and carried her. 
silence and look at her. Tell her myself I ought to grab the jack handle in the trunk compartment and swing it on him, but I didn't do it. I was afraid. I was afraid I'd never live to see Josie and Johnny again. I placed Mrs. Baker in the trunk gently. And then he made me go back for the other one. Push him in, Angelo. Or his coat will stick through the door when you close it. That's better. Very good. Close the trunk. As I locked the trunk door, I grabbed the handle and bit my lip to keep from passing out. Don't you feel well? Hot. I'll be all right. Yes. You'll be all right as soon as we hit the road. The fresh country air will straighten you out. Get behind the wheel, please. I got in and he got in the back seat. I must remind you, Angelo. I'll be right here behind you. With this gun in the back of your neck. Don't try to trick me. Radio taxi calling 64. Hey, Minetti. Why don't you answer? What's the idea? Don't answer, Angelo. Call me on the phone if your mic is out of order. Ignore him, Angelo. Start driving. Where to, Mr. Baker? Just keep going. But stay off the Hutchinson Parkway. Patrol cars, you know. Take the back roads. You'll find a nice, quiet place for them. We went north on the post road. Louis call breaking in on us every minute or so. Calling 64. Radio taxi calling 64. Persistent fellow, isn't he? Well, well he's sorry. Expect me back to relieve him so he can go down to the diner for a bite. Pass me that cigarette lighter on the dashboard. Don't you hear me? I want the cigarette lighter. Oh, uh, it's not working. Have you got any matches? In my pocket. Well, let me have them. I reached into the side pocket of my jacket, fumbling through my handkerchief and keys for the pack of matches. And then my fingers touched the crayon. A small piece of black crayon, no bigger than an inch long, with a paper wrapping. A small piece of crayon I'd taken away from Johnny after I yelled at him and made him cry for marking up the wall. What about those matches? Uh, yeah. Here you are. I handed over the matches. But the piece of crayon was in my palm, concealed and held tight by my little finger and the one next to it. He lit his cigarette. You want a cigarette, Angelo? Uh, no, thanks. <laughs> There ever was a time in my life I needed a smoke, it was then. But I was trembling with an idea. An idea to make my microphone stay open so Louie could hear me without Mr. Baker getting wise. But I had to hold on to the crayon. I couldn't take a chance reaching for a cigarette. I might drop that crayon. I waited for Louie to call me again. Call me 64. Hey, Minetti. You all right? Call me from a phone if you can hear me. Uh, say, Mr. Baker, maybe I better answer him. Why? Well, well, he, he might think I'm in a wreck and he'll have the cops start looking for me. Yes. Yes, you're quite right. Very well, talk to him. But be careful what you tell him. I picked the microphone off the dashboard with the hand that held the piece of crayon. 64, calling radio taxi. Where the heck you been, Angelo? Uh, let me explain, Louis. He's sitting here without a relief. Fine pal, depending on you. Get back here. I'm going down to the diner. I kept gabbing to Louis and forcing the crayon into the button on the mic, right into the hole that housed the spring button, hoping the paper wrapping on the crayon would wedge the button and keep my sending circuit open. Uh, Louis. Uh, uh, Louis, I'm fixing a flat... Uh, m- must be a loose wire. I-, I didn't hear you until just now. I'll be back as soon as I can. Roger. I put the mic back on the dashboard. Hook, praying the crayon wedge would hold. As long as that button was wedged on, Louie couldn't talk to me. As the voice came through, I'd know the crayon had slipped out. I waited. Seconds seemed like hours. No word from Louie, so the wedge was holding. I raised my voice so it would carry the two feet between me and the mic. Uh, m- m- Mr. Baker, uh, are you going to kill me, too? Kill you? Yeah. Yeah, like like, like you killed Mrs. Baker and, and Walter? I, I've been thinking about what I ought to do with you, Angelo. No, don't, don't kill me, please. I've I got to wipe the kid off, play dumb. I swear I will. I'll, I'll never tell anyone that you killed two people. Uh, where are we? 
Where, where are we going to hide the bodies? We'll, we'll run out of gas if we keep going like this. I know where we'll go. Lake Hatoma. Doris loved Lake Hatoma. We used to go there weekends long ago. Uh, where is Lake Hatoma? About 40 miles from here. 40 miles? I knew I had to find some way to stall them. The range of my cab's transmitter was about 30 miles. If I ever got out of range, I was done for. I had no way of knowing whether Louis had left the office or if he caught my first words telling him about my danger. Uh, do you know how to get to Lake Katoma from here, Mr. Baker? Roughly, I know we used to go past White Plains. Well, I, I got a map. Good. Stop the car. Take a look at it. Now, let's see. White Plains. Uh, yeah, yeah, Lake Katoma. There it is. Uh, we go up here and then... Uh-huh. I know where it is. Sure, sure. All right, let's go. We'll go the most direct way. No details, mind you. Oh, no, sir. No, sir. We're, we're on Weaver Street now. We keep going up Weaver Street till we get into old Mamaronic Road. That sounds right, but hurry. I'm getting very tired. Step on the gas. I heard him, but I played dumb. Don't you hear me? I said let's go faster. Yeah, uh, sure. Sure, anything you say, Mr. Baker... But uh, you think it's smart? We're doing 50 now. It's not very fast in the country. Well, county patrol cars are all through this section. We'll get caught speeding. That's quite all right. I'll pay the fine. Faster, Angelo. That's better. 60, 65, 70. Faster. It'll soon be daylight and I'm very tired. I'm very tired. I, I wonder if Doris is tired. Uh, say, what did I tell you? This is Weaver Street. And then into Old Mamarina Crawl. Oh. Hear that? Patrol car? I told you. Here comes our speeding ticket. Slow down. But remember, I'll have the gun in my coat pocket. Let me do the talking. Just accept the ticket and we'll be on our way. Oh! The patrol car let me roll ahead and swung in behind us and we came to a stop. Where do you think you're going? You were doing 80. Let's see your license. It, it's my fault, officer. I asked him to... Yeah, what for? Well, there, there's been a death in my family. My wife. Sorry. So I have to give the driver the ticket. He looked at my license in the beam of the patrol car headlight. And he started making out the ticket. And then in the side mirror of my cab, I could see another cop get out of the patrol car with a gun in his hand. And I saw him sneak down on the right side of the cab. He stuck the gun through the open back window just as Mr. Baker saw him. Don't move. What? Ah. 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 Too bad we couldn't take him in. Oh, it held, Johnny. It held. Say, uh, how come this guy didn't get wise? Your microphone circuit was open. You want to know? You really want to know? I'm leaving the house to go to work, see you. In a hall, my, my kid, Johnny, is walking up the walls with crayon. I, I yell at him and I make him cry. I take the crayon away. And that's, that's what kept the mic open. Hey, look. Look here. You see? The, the crayon's still holding the buttons down. Hey, you got any kids? Yeah, why? You, you think I done right? Yelling at Johnny? <laughs> It's just goes to show you a fella can do a lot worse than stopping in the middle of the night for a lovely siren. As you fathers, next time you find Junior's crayon scrawls all over the house, he means well. Just trying to show you the handwriting on the wall. Oh, this reminds me of a fella I know who's crazy about baseball. When the uh, warden asked him what he wanted for a last request, he said he'd like to watch a game from the scaffold. But they called it after the sixth, so he could enjoy a seventh inning stretch. <laughs> Sanctum was heard in the United States over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
and has been rebroadcast for service men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. <laughs>